Good morning everyone. Today's Bible reading is taken from Exodus chapter 16 verses beginning from 2 to 15. Exodus chapter 16 verses from 2. There in the desert they all complained to Moses and Aaron and said to them, We wish that the Lord had killed us in Egypt. There we could at least sit down and eat meat and as much other food as we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve us all to death. The Lord said to Moses, Now I am going to make food rain down from the sky for all of you. The people must go out every day and gather enough for that day. In this way I can test them to find out if they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, they ought to bring in twice as much as usual and prepare it. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, This evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. In the morning you will see the dazzling light of the Lord's presence. He has heard your complaints against him. Yes, against him because we are only carrying out his instructions. Then Moses said, It is the Lord who will give you meat to eat in the evening and as much bread as you want in the morning, because he has heard how much you have complained against him. When you complain against us, you are really complaining against the Lord. Moses said to Aaron, Tell the whole community to come and stand before the Lord because he has heard their complaints. As Aaron spoke to the whole community, they turned towards the desert and suddenly the dazzling light of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them that at twilight they will have meat to eat and in the morning they will have all the bread they want. Then they will know that I, the Lord, am their God. In the evening a large flock of quails flew in, enough to cover the camp, and in the morning there was dew all around the camp. When the dew evaporated, there was something thin and flaky on the surface of the desert. It was as delicate as frost. When the Israelites saw it, they did not know what it was and asked each other, What is it? Moses said to them, This is the food that the Lord has given you to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading today comes from Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, if my brother keeps on sinning against me, how many times do I have to forgive him? Seven times? No, not seven times, answered Jesus, but seventy times seven, because the kingdom of heaven is like this. Once there was a king who decided to check on his servants' accounts. He had just begun to do so, one of them was bought him and owed him millions of pounds. The servant did not have enough to pay his debt, so the king ordered him to be sold as a slave with his wife and his children and all he had in order to pay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before the king. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay you everything. The king felt sorry for him, so he forgave him the debt and let him go. Then the man went out and met one of his fellow servants who owed him a few pounds. He grabbed and started choking him. Pay back what you owe me, he said. His fellow servant fell down and begged him. Be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused instead. He had thrown him into jail until he should pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were very upset and went to the king and told him everything. So he called the servant in. You worthless slave, he said. 
I forgave you the whole amount you owed me just because you asked me to. You should have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you. The king was very angry and he sent the servant to jail to be punished until he should pay back the whole amount. And Jesus concluded, This is how my Father in heaven will treat every one of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We live in what often seems to be an unforgiving world. If a public figure makes a mistake, a resignation is demanded or the person sacking is called for. Forgiveness can be in such short supply that forgiveness itself makes the news headlines. Such as when a couple of years ago Neville Lawrence declared his forgiveness of the murderers of his son Stephen Lawrence. In the Bible we find a changing pattern of vengeance and forgiveness. In Genesis we read that a descendant of Cain, who, remember, murdered his brother Abel, this descendant said, If seven lives are taken to pay for killing Cain, seventy-seven will be taken if anyone kills me. In other words, a tenfold escalation in hostilities. In the ancient world, a person would feel entirely justified in inflicting maximum vengeance or mischief upon his enemies. A son would even seek vengeance on the descendants of the enemies of his father. But the law given to the Israelites, recorded in Exodus, sets a limitation. An eye for an eye. It limited the punishment to something more on par with the crime although that law was and sometimes still is misused to justify revenge. At the time of Jesus, the rabbinic teaching of the day from the Talmud was more conciliatory. If a man commits an offence once, they forgive him. A second time, they forgive him. A third time, they forgive him. The fourth time, they do not forgive him. Compared to the pagan world around, this was very liberal. Well, a little earlier in chapter 18 of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus had been teaching his disciples about how to deal with your brother if he sins against you. It said, if your brother sins against you, go to him and show him his fault. Do it privately, just between yourselves. If he listens to you, you have won back your brother. So it wasn't unnatural for Peter to wonder how long this might go on for. So Peter came to Jesus and asked, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? Is it seven times? Do you, Lord, say we should forgive even more than our rabbis have taught us? Peter probably thought he was being unusually liberal and sufficiently generous. And Jesus' answer is not seven times, but 70 times seven. In other words, Jesus really isn't expecting us to count. And so Jesus tells this parable that even for us is apparently quite easy to understand. The servant in the tale is some high-ranking official in the king's service who owed a massive debt. Millions of pounds, the Good News Bible says. Literally, it's 10,000 talents. 10,000 is the largest Greek numeral and the talent was the highest unit of currency. The point is, it was a huge debt that nobody could possibly pay. The servant owed billions. The servant fell on his knees and begged, be patient with me and I will pay you everything. What, we might think? We see Jesus' humour here. The debt is incalculable and the man is asking for more time to pay. He needs to get real. Well, then the unimaginable happened. The king felt sorry for him, so forgave him the debt and let him go. Our translation loses something here. It says he felt sorry for him. Literally, the king had a gut reaction, a deep inner feeling. He felt compassion, pity. It's the same word used of Jesus as he responded to deep human need as when he had compassion on the people who were like sheep without a shepherd, or his compassion 
to feed the multitude. However, another servant owed this servant a paltry sum, and when he could not pay, the first servant showed no mercy and had him locked up in prison. The imprisoned servant's friends were appalled by this treatment, and when the king found out about it, the king revoked his original pardon and had the man locked up. And Jesus concludes, That is how my Father in heaven will treat every one of you, unless you forgive your brother from your heart. So what can we learn from this parable? Jesus began his teaching saying the kingdom of heaven is like this. I want to pick out three key things that this parable teaches. First, the kingdom of heaven is where debts which are impossible to pay are forgiven. The king, of course, represents God and the king decided to check on his servants' accounts. You and I are that servant and there is a day of reckoning. We will be called to account. And like that servant, we each have a debt too great to bear. We've each fallen short of what we were intended to be and try as we might, we can never make up for our wrongdoing. No amount of effort or striving can restore our broken relationship with God. In the parable, the servant fell on his knees and begged the king, well, how much more does the living God forgive us when we come to him? That is what God requires. It's for us to realise our indebtedness to him and to seek our forgiveness. Now, if we owed millions of pounds like the servant and we had no way of paying, which of us would insist on trying to pay the debt ourselves and refuse the chance for it to be cancelled? Well, our debt is even greater. Our debt means death and destruction. Who can refuse the offer of forgiveness from God? This is the heart of the gospel. God loved us so much that he gave his son to die so that we could be forgiven. Our forgiveness was made possible at very great cost. Who are we to refuse when there is no other way we could possibly pay? When there is no other way we could be free from sin? Second, the kingdom is where the subjects in the kingdom reflect that forgiveness in their lives. If the church is the community of people who've been forgiven, then a key mark of this community is that our common life together reflects the forgiveness we've received. And so the parable echoes and reinforces other teaching of Jesus, where he said, Be merciful, as your Father is merciful. Or blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. And it reminds us how we were taught to pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. The servant in this parable is unbelievably oblivious to the implications of the forgiveness he'd received. He didn't seem to understand the weight of it, and so he failed to extend that forgiveness to his own servant. We, however, are to understand the vast magnitude of our debt, the depth of the Father's love, the great cost of Jesus' life offered and given, the incredible gift of our forgiveness. We're to understand it so much that it overflows in our lives as we forgive those who sin against us. And thirdly, the kingdom is where those who refuse to forgive must expect God to judge their sins with like severity. Does that seem a bit harsh? This is where the real challenge of the parable is. The truth is, most of us are slow to forgive, and even slower to forget. But when we listen to this parable, it's impossible not to be struck by just how badly the servant behaved. He'd been given forgiven a vast amount, and yet he could not forgive a few pounds. We don't tend to think that this servant is treated harshly. He gets what he deserves. Each one of us could be that servant. But we won't be like him as long as we grasp the magnitude of our debt and the extent 
to which we have been forgiven. So in summary, let us live out the forgiveness we have each received. Amen.